guys doing this morning? Good. I'm glad that you guys are here to worship. Whether you know it or not, you heeded God's call to come. And uh, he's going to talk to you this morning through our worship and through the sermon. So if you are new here or not yet a believer or still on your journey, that's okay. We're just, we're glad that you're here. We're honored that you are here. And whether you know it or not, you heeded God's call. So if you guys can stand with us this morning, um, Pastor Larry, he um, and Therese, they're out on vacation, a well-deserved and needed vacation. And they're going to be um, off, I believe, in San Luis Obispo at another church service. So we just pray over them that they get fed today and see what God is doing in the church body across the state. And if not, for him to speak, for both of them to speak into other people's lives. So. These first two songs are all about praise to God. They're praise and, and worship for us to magnify God this morning. Um, so let's go ahead and worship. Let our praise be your welcome, let our songs be a song, we are here for you, we are here for you, let your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your life, we are here for you. Your anthem, your ring. 
trip again Cause I know that my father is here My father Show me a way Away from the pain of the sin That I stumbled the time? Always good. Always good. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm losing my place. Good morning, guys. Welcome to CCF, your home church, our home church, my home church. So glad to see the same faces and new faces. Uh, bring somebody. Bring somebody. Let's grow this place. Amen. So uh, real quick thing this morning for you guys. Uh, Wednesday, I talked about, uh, went over James uh, chapter two, and I was so frustrated because after I was done, I'm driving home and something else popped in my head. I was like, oh, I could have said, I should have said that. And it's, it, it's really because I thought it made things a little more clear to me. And so when we're talking about faith and works and the, you know, it's faith without works is dead and some of us get upset about that and it sounds like legalism, but there's a part I missed where James talks about the body is dead without the spirit. And so I thought maybe this will make a little clear. You can't show your spirit without a body, right? Show me your spirit. Well, I can't show you my spirit because I have to have a body for you to see, right? And so it made a connection better for me that just like the faith and works, so we don't stumble over that, is the same way. You have a body. You can't express your spirit unless you have a body. So I don't know if that helps you guys, but I wanted to throw that out there to see the connection because the point is for it to make sense to us and not just go, okay, a pastor said that's what it is and that's what it is. We want to think about it and have it make sense to us, right? So hopefully that helps this morning. But the end result is this, like I said on Wednesday, the point is you are created to do good works for God. That's why he made you. And so this morning, as we're rustling and revisiting James, I just want to encourage us to do good works. Go do them. God has planned them for you. Don't worry. Don't be upset. Don't be nervous, but go do good things because your father in heaven made you to do that. And you will show his spirit. You'll show his love and there will be no doubt who you belong to. Let me pray for you all. Let me pray for us. Father, this morning, we're here to, to worship you, Lord. We're here to, to, as a community, Lord, as a group, a corporate body, Father, with one spirit, one heart, Lord, if we can put it that way. We're here for you, Lord. 
We want you to bless us, Father. Give us a great blessing. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to use our mouths and our hearts and our souls, Lord, to express back to you while we're together one voice and one thought, Lord, that you are great. You are our God, and your Son is our Savior and our most cherished possession, Lord. Help us to praise you the way you deserve this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jason. You guys can stand again with us. Um, a thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe to sing the song of ages to the land. Your name your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dimensions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever and if you've been forgiven and if you've been
Pastor Larry sent us uh, over a text, and he was talking about our job as worship leaders. And it's not to um, be the center of attention, or it's not to, it's not about us. It's about us helping each other to sing praises to the to the Lord, to the King of Kings. Um, and he talked about how we should magnify that our job is to help magnify the Lord, not because he's small like a like a microscope. And we have to magnify him that way. But it's like a star that's millions of miles away. And we look and we understand how huge he is. And how sometimes he can feel so small to us. But he's not. He's huge. And he has your life in his hands. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Your shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about my Jesus.
You guys may be seated, and we're going to have Pastor Ernie Vilches come up and give us some announcements. You know, as we get started this morning, I'd just like to pray uh, for clear understanding, clear words from God this morning. So join me in prayer. Father, as we gather, um, I pray that you will bless this time for each of us, Lord, that we're strengthened, that uh, we're at peace in our hearts. May the words uh, that you have here for us today, your message, penetrate each of us to the core, uh, that you may continue to do your work uh, that you've already begun in our hearts and minds. Lord, we give it to you, all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, you know, uh, I want to look in the Old Testament, and if you have your Bibles with you, that would be great. If you have your electronic devices, you can turn to that as well. We're going to be, like I said, the Old Testament in the book of Judges. And uh, we're kind of going to go through parts of the book of Judges uh, this morning. And um, the book itself covers the history of Israel from the time uh, after Joshua's death. So if you remember, Moses led Israel through the desert after they left Egypt. And when they get to the Jordan River, that's when he dies and he passes the the reins over to Joshua. And Joshua is who led the Israelites over the Jordan River and into the land that God had promised them. Uh, And so When they went across, God had given them all the land of Canaan and had split it between the 12 tribes, and he had assigned people to certain areas of the kingdom. And so they went in there, and uh, God gave over all their enemies that lived in the land over to the Israelites, and they routed them. And they were to uh, get them out of there, and they were to take possession of the land. Well, that continued until Joshua eventually died at the age of 110. And so at that time, there was really no one to take the reins. And in that period of Joshua's life, the generation that worked with him and helped him lead eventually died off. And so what we were left was the generation that came afterwards. The generations that came afterwards... uh, neglected God, and they uh, forgot all that God had done for them and bringing them out of slavery, taking them through the desert, giving them the land of Canaan. They just forgot all about that. And because there was no king or, or natural leader, they consequently forgot their identity as God's chosen people. So uh, instead, they settled in among the remaining Canaanites, and instead of bringing God to them, they took in all of the Canaanite practices, their morals, their gods, their religious uh, practices, and their social customs. They just kind of switched over and became like the people there. And um, really what it amounted to was a rejection of God's kingship uh, as they turned to these Canaanite gods for blessings, which would never come, as we know. So what happened was God raised different people to be leaders for Israel during this time. And so he, over the course of this, these years, and it would have been quite a, way, uh, quite a bit of time, maybe a couple hundred years, God brought different uh, judges, they called them, uh, and really we could say leaders, to bring about, um, the purpose was to restore Israel through repentance restore a right relationship with God. So let me show you, uh, let me read a little bit here in chapter 2 just to show you what was going on at that time. Then the Lord raised up judges. This is verse 16 of chapter 2. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshiped them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked, the way of obedience to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, 
he was with the judge and saved them, that is the Israelites, out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under these oppressed and afflicted, and from those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods, serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. We, we can say a lot about that, and we'll see here as we go through it uh, what's happening with that. But what, what really is happening at this point is the Israelites have opened the door now to this repeated cycle, right? Uh, they are disobedient to God. They ignore God. And then God gives them over to their enemies. Now, these people that they settled in still didn't like that the Israelites were coming in. So they were their enemies, and they would raid them. They would do all kinds of things and exert pressure on them and even fight them, you know, in battles. So uh, they would have disobedience, then oppression. Then it would be too much, and the Israelites would cry out in distress, Oh, Lord, save us. Then the Lord would bring a judge, and the judge would deliver them from the oppression until that judge died. And then... They went right back to the old way. And so God would bring another judge. And like I said, this went on for a couple hundred years. So these judges, there's a story about most of them in the Bible. Some of them are very small roles. Others are larger. Gideon is one of them. You remember the story of Gideon. He was one of the judges. We're going to focus today on one particular judge, and that's Samson. He was the last one of the judges. And the reason I like Samson, it's really kind of, as a, as a kid, I was probably, had to be mid to late 60s. I saw an old movie on TV, Samson and Delilah. It, it starred Victor Mature and Hedy Lamar. And if you're older here today, you'll remember those names. I only remembered them because I looked it up. But, so I'm not that old. But anyway, uh, it was a great movie. It was, it was directed by Cecil B. DeMille. And Cecil B. DeMille was the one that made the Ten Commandments and all these big-time movies. And so, of course, it was colorized. It was made in 1950. And so when I saw it in the mid-60s or late-60s, it was older. I saw it on TV. I didn't have to go to the theater to see it. And, uh, but I was mesmerized by it. And, and what young man wouldn't be mesmerized by the story of Samson? Because he... He did these feats of strength, and he defeated enemies, and he loved the beautiful woman, and all these things, although as a young man, we probably weren't thinking about that part of it. We were just waiting for the sword fights and stuff, but uh, anyway, it really stuck in my mind, and as I was reading through the Bible, uh, and I got into the book of Judges, and then when I came to Samson, all these memories came back, and I started reading Samson now. For sure, and I actually started doing some research on it because a lot of times as we read the Bible, we can just kind of read from chapter 3 through chapter 4 or 5, and then we put it down and we may not think about what we read. But when you stop and you look at some of the things that are said, as we'll see later on here, that there are some magnificent things happening. And Samson's life is no different. See, God has always wanted a relationship with his people. And Samson and the Israelites as a whole are a picture of us today because we fall into the same kinds of traps. God wants to pour out his blessings on us, uh, not just for the church as a whole, but on each one of us individually. God wants to pour out blessings on you. And that's such a great thing. But sometimes we choose not to be connected to him, right? Just like the Israelites did. They didn't want to be encumbered with having to bow down metaphorically before a God who they didn't even see. And they wanted to just do their own thing. We did not want the responsibility. Today, we don't want the responsibilities as Christians sometimes. But when we choose not to engage with God who is there, who is waiting for us to come 
before him. When we choose not to engage, the problem is it leads us into poor choices. God has given us free will. We don't have to engage with anybody if we don't want to. But when we don't heed the Spirit's call, it will lead us to troubled times. And we'll see that here in the life of Samson, how much trouble came by. So Samson is found in the book of Judges, and it's chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16. And what's interesting is that that's the book of Samson, the life of Samson. But the whole first chapter, chapter 13, he's not even born yet. And everything that is happening before he born, he's born is so interesting to me because we really get to see some things that, like I said, when we just read the Bible, we'll miss. So let me read you uh, the first five verses of chapter 13. Again, like we said, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. 40 years. That's a long time. Now, a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites, the tribe of Dan, had a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are sterile and childless but you're going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So there's a lot to unpack here in just those first five verses. First off, the angel of the Lord that appears to the woman, and by the way, we never hear the woman's name. She's always addressed as the wife of Manoah. And the angel of the Lord appears to the woman. The Bible reads as the angel of the Lord, and that's the distinction that we have to recognize. When the Bible says an angel of the Lord comes... That is an angel sent by God with a message from God. There's no authority. There's no powers. There's nothing other than what God has given this angel to pass along. When the Bible says the angel of the Lord, we can rest assured that, that what they're referring to is a theophany or a Christophany, that it is Christ incarnate or pre-incarnate, excuse me, before Christ came as a human to be born at Bethlehem, Christ existed. We have always heard this. In the beginning, he was with God. All things were created through him and for him. Christ existed before he came as a human. He's always existed. He is God. And so he has always existed. And so what's interesting here is we get a picture of, of Christ coming again as an, uh, to, as in an appearance, a um, visual manifestation that someone can see and talk to. And uh, he is God. He is Christ. Uh, and gets us an image of his preexistence. Not only that, but the angel of the Lord comes to the woman and he speaks to her. Now, in the culture at that time, a man by himself would never approach a woman by herself and speak to her. That just wasn't done. In fact, women, remember, were kind of considered second-class citizens at the time. And so it just never would be done. Now, the woman recognizes that this is somebody of importance, but she does not know that it is Christ. She, she doesn't know it's God. She... The, but he comes and now he gets personal with her. You are sterile and remain childless. Remember, in that time, women in their roles, if they didn't have children, if they couldn't bear children, there was a stigma to that. There was a sense of shame because they could not physically fulfill the role that they were designed for, to bear children, to continue the name and all of that. So there was a stigma there. And so uh, 
the angel of the Lord tells her. And that's not like common knowledge. If you were like that and you were feeling the shame, that's not something you shared with everybody. You kept that to yourself and you buried it. But he comes and he already knows. You are sterile and you cannot bear children. He says, but you're going to conceive a son. You know that this already gives us an indicator of how special this moment is because there's only a handful of times in the Bible where an angel prophesies to somebody about their coming son. We can see it. We can count it on one hand. Christ appeared to Hagar, Abraham's concubine, I guess, uh, when she ran off into the desert and she's afraid and she's crying and the angel uh, appears to her and says, no, you're going to have a son. His name is going to be Ishmael and I'm going to make a nation out of him. And then uh, the, the angel, the angel of the Lord appeared to uh, Sarah and Abraham regarding the birth of Isaac. And then uh, the angel appeared to Isaiah, the prophet, and told him about the coming Emmanuel. Then uh, Zechariah met the angel when he was told that he was going to have a son at an old age, he and his wife Elizabeth, and he was to be John the Baptist. And then the last time, of course, is when the angel appeared to Mary to tell her about the coming Jesus. So already we can see that the proclamation of the coming son is right up there because it just doesn't, because of the, it's special because of the scarcity of times that it happens in the Bible. And then on top of that, he says, he's going to be a Nazarite. Well, the Nazar, the root word is uh, Hebrew for to consecrate oneself to. So he is going to be consecrated to God. That means that he's going to be put into service of God, and that is his purpose. He is, being, he is coming to serve God in a special way. And this Nazarite position was originally established by God back uh, earlier on while they were still in the desert, the Israelites. And traditionally, it was just a temporary position. A person could take a vow to become a Nazarite for 30 days, you know, a month, uh, three months, whatever it was. And usually it was a specific purpose. Maybe they wanted to draw closer to God in their own life. That was for a spiritual discipline, uh, a devotion to God. There were certain reasons for taking it. But usually it was a temporary position. Now, I already read about what some of the restrictions were, and I'll, I'll show them again, but the idea is that um, usually it's a temporary position, but in verse 5 it says, he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Well, there's no time frame there given by the angel. We don't know. So we'll, what we'll see is that for Samson, it was for life. And again, here's another special idea of it. There was only two other times in the Bible that the Nazarite became a Nazarite for life. Only two times. Samuel the prophet and John the Baptist. Both proclaimed. Hannah, uh, Samuel's mother, dedicates him to the Lord when she is childless and asks for a son and if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to the Lord. And that's why Samuel came as he did. Uh, John the Baptist, it was directed by the angel that he was to be a Nazarite. But those are the only two uh, instances in the Bible where we see a Nazarite for life. So when we think about Nazarite, we think about all the things that they're not, they're not supposed to do. No fermented drink, no unclean food, no razor on the head. And all we think about is these rules, these restrictions. And, uh, but the but for God, the purpose is um, separating us from the things that hinder us. Uh, in other words, he's not, I mean, he is concerned about the outward influences, but he's mainly concerned about the inward influences, the things that hold us back. And so that's why 
he established these uh, restrictions for the Nazarite role. And really, when we think about it, isn't that what God wants from each of us? To be able to drop away the things around us, the things of the culture, the things that bind us up, and focus on him. So it's really, we can be all called Nazarites if we're uh, in that position. So let's continue here with um, the woman uh, that, that's the wife of Manoah. So after the angel leaves, the woman runs to her husband and he, he's out in the field. And she goes, guess what, guess what? I go, a man of God just appeared to me. He told me I'm going to have a son. He told me that he's going to do, and she lists all the restrictions and that he's going to be a Nazarite. And this is news to them. It's news to Manoah. And he immediately drops down in prayer. Oh, God, please send this man back so that we can be clear about what we're to do. And he prays this, and God answers him. A few days later, the angel reappears. But he did not reappear to Manoah. He came back to the woman. Now, the woman is in the field this time by herself, and the angel appears again. Now, he's not appearing like that, uh, like you might see on TV. He walks up to the woman. So again, she sees that he's a man of God, but she doesn't know that he's the angel of the Lord. And so she sees him. She goes, wait just a minute. And she runs and gets Manoah. The man has come back. You've got to listen to him. Come back, come back. And Manoah follows her. And they get right there to where he's at, the, the angel is. And uh, but what's so interesting is that here it is in this culture where the woman is a second-class citizen, yet the angels appeared to the woman twice, alone. Something that wasn't done. And so I started thinking about, what's the point there? Because there's something to this. And what we can find out is that God is breaking down the barriers between men and women. In his eyes, his people are all equal. The man-woman barrier was a cultural thing, but in God's eyes, we're all equal. We're all his children should we choose to commit ourselves to him. And that one is more than another. So I, I really love that aspect of it that we can find those kind of things out here. So Manoah runs with his wife and they encounter the angel and he has two questions. Are you the one that appeared to my wife the first time? Because he wants to know. And he goes, I am. He goes, okay. Now when your words are fulfilled, he doesn't ask me, he doesn't ask the angel, hey, is it really going to happen? Or anything like that. He goes, when your words are fulfilled, what are are to be the rules for raising the boy up. He wants to be clear about what is being asked of him. And so I like that, that Manoah wants to get it right. He has a heart here. Remember, they really haven't had, in their society, they really aren't following God. You know, they're all enmeshed in that culture of the time. So, um, but he has a desire to do the right thing. So, uh, after he asks what, what are the rules to be, the angel again repeats all the restrictions for the Nazarite role. And then after he's done telling him, uh, Manoah, in that time, it was common courtesy to prepare a meal for your guests. So he goes, why won't you stay with us and let us prepare a fresh goat and you can dine with us? And... Um, uh, he said, uh, let me, in fact, let me read this here because this is verse 15. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. And that's because Manoah did not yet realize that it was an angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name? so that we may honor you when your word comes true. 
See, the angel is sitting there, and Manoah offers a common courtesy. When the angel says, even though you detain me, even though you're holding me up, does that sound like a common courtesy returned? It doesn't. It's very interesting. But what's happening here is that the angel is really kind of treating Manoah and the Israelites the same way they, they've treated him. There is no relationship here. There is no sense of being God's people. These people are enmeshed in the culture there, in the Canaanite culture. And he's going, no, I really don't know you. But my plan will stand. And so that's why I'm here. So he goes, even though you detain me, I will not eat your food. And then he suggests, but rather than a meal, why won't you offer up a burnt offering? And uh, so that's a suggestion. Why do you think he made that suggestion? A burnt offering was intended to be uh, an atonement for sin. So he is letting Manoah know, in a kind of a roundabout way, I guess, that you are sinning. And you need to turn from this sin. And so that's why he encourages the burnt offering. And we'll continue here in verse 18. Uh, he goes, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? And he replied, why do you ask my name? And basically what he's saying is, why do you care? You haven't cared yet. Why are you caring now? Well, it was a legitimate request, you know, he didn't know that the angel was the angel of the Lord. He thought he was just a man of God, you know, prophesying over him. So, but the angel says, he goes, why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. Now, beyond understanding is associated with, when we say it's, uh, we can use words like wonderful, full of wonder. We can also use words like, uh, it's associated with, the wondrous acts of God. And it can be to go all over the place, and I'm really amazed by it. And so anyway, continuing on in verse 19 and 20, then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. Now, typically when they did an offering, they did it on an existing altar. There was already a fire burning. It's hot. You put the sacrifice on the altar and the altar and the fire burns it up. Manoah and his wife are in the middle of a field and there's a rock there. He takes a goat. He sacrifices it on the rock with a grain offering as an atonement for sin, although I'm not sure he really understood that. He just did what the angel said. And there isn't this constant fire burning that's already hot. He starts his own fire. He's in the middle of a field. Now some wondrous things begin to happen. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. So they're all three standing in the field. The fire's burning. He puts the goat as a sacrifice, the grain offering on the rock. The fire is burning slowly. Typically what happens is in a burnt offering, they leave the offering on the altar overnight. It takes that long for the fire to consume the whole uh, body. And so what happens is they uh, are watching and a fire erupts from the rock, envelops the whole sacrifice and burns with flames up into heaven. They're amazed. They're going, was there something special in that fire? I don't know. They don't know what happened. They just see this big, huge flame, and it takes the whole sacrifice. And what's happening here is beautiful because they make the sacrifice as the angel said. And I don't know if he understood, but God accepted his sacrifice. That act of making the sacrifice, that act of giving uh, themselves over to what the angel told him to do was good enough for God. And God said, I accept. And the fire burns up the whole sacrifice 
with flames that reach into heaven. And then guess what? The angel who had been standing next to Manoah and his wife steps into the flame and is immediately taken up into heaven. Manoah and his wife go, whoa! And they immediately drop to their face because they are realizing that something amazing has happened. Amen. Amen. <laughs> they understand that they're on, on hollowed ground, that this is a holy place. And I kind of laugh because I think they're laying face down. And then slowly they open an eye and they kind of look around because <laughs> they've been there for a while and all they hear is the flame. And they're looking around and they realize the angel is gone and he has not come back. And so they stand up, and Manoah goes, he's not thinking it through, he's moved by the moment, and who wouldn't be? Verse 22, we are doomed to die, he said to his wife. He said to his wife, we have seen God's face. You remember back when Moses appeared, uh, met God um, on the mountaintop. And God said, he goes, I'm going to reveal myself to you, but I'm going to hide you in the crag of the mountain because no one can see my face and live. So they remember that teaching. All of a sudden, that teaching comes back to Manoah and he's freaked out. We're going to die. And the wife, and this is the reason why I think the angel appeared to the wife too. There's another aspect. She remains calm. She's thinking this through. She sees the context in which the angel has appeared. And she says to him, so wait, ho, ho, ho. If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things now, nor told us this. Hold on. He wouldn't have done all these things if he meant to kill us. Noah stands up. I knew that. I was just checking to see if you knew. So they go on, and um, they, uh, from this point on now, they continue. The, the woman becomes pregnant, and uh, she gives birth to a boy and names him Samson. And he grew, and the Lord began to stir uh, within him while he was there in, uh, in the, the village So now, if we were to move over to chapter 14, we can see some changes have been made. Chapter 14 opens up, that's the very next chapter, and Samson is now a young man. And uh, let me read the first a few verses of chapter 14. Samson went down to Timnah. Timnah, where they lived, Zorah, that small town, was right on the border between the, the land of Judah and on this side of the hill was the land of Philistia where the Philistines lived. So it wasn't much of a travel to go across the border and visit. So Samson goes to Timnah, the Philistine town, and there he saw a young Philistine woman. And when he returned, he says to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. And his father and mother kind of look at each other and they reply, uh, isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among our people? All our people, there's beautiful women here. And he goes, must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? So what we're seeing here is a few things about Samson's character, right? Number one, he's impulsive. He goes to Timnah, I don't know if that's why he went there. The Bible doesn't tell us. But he goes to Timnah, the Philistine town, and he sees the girl and he goes, get her for me, now! This is the woman I want to marry. All he could have done is seen that she was maybe beautiful, I don't know. It doesn't give us a description. But I'm assuming that. And so what we see is he's beginning to have this affection for Philistine women. Okay, but there is some troubles here for that. And it really becomes a lesson for us as parents. And I know we've got some young parents back here. 
Sometimes we're called to speak truth into the lives of our children. We don't like it. We love our children. We want to just give them everything. But sometimes the things that they're asking for, we know as adults, it's not good for them. And so we hesitate. Sometimes we let fear run our lives. And we go, I don't want to make him mad. If your child is an adult now, you really don't want to upset them because that adult doesn't need you anymore. And they may just end the relationship. So whenever they have these demands or these ideas that we know are not right for them, we have to speak truth into their lives. And that's what we're called to do. Does it always work? No. Sometimes our children are just like Samson, impulsive, headstrong, with a desire for things that may not be good for us. So Samson wants this, and it's, not, and it's against his parents' desire. And so even though we occasionally can make bad choices, remember, this is all, like in Samson's uh, instance, this is part of God's plan. And God's plan will not be thwarted. When we give in to sin, his purpose will still be accomplished, even though we did it the hard way. See, we know that sin brings sometimes painful consequences. And if we're to be used by God for his purpose, for his glory, as a part of his plan, my thinking is this, wouldn't it be easier if we just went with his plan in obedience to God? The same thing is going to be accomplished, we know that. But what's missing is the painful consequences of disobedience. So when we think about our lives and when you think about speaking into your children's lives, remember this. Being obedient to what we know about God's character and what he wants for us is always better than doing our own thing. Remember that God's orchestrating this whole thing. So I know we're getting close on time here. So I want to just go through this real quick. If we look at chapter 14, verse 5, Samson takes his parents and they travel to the town because he wants his parents to meet the girl. And as they're traveling, they're traveling through the hills to get to Timnah, Samson uh, gets separated from his parents. They're walking on the path and Samson is going to go, ah, I'm going to go this way. And he travels through the vineyards. And uh, while he's traveling through the vineyards, a lion attacks him. And they had lions at that time. And one could think of like mountain lions or whatever. But this lion attacks Samson. And in that moment, the power of the Holy Spirit comes over him. And he fights with the lion. And he kills the lion. He rips it to pieces. And he gets up and he dusts himself off. And he continues walking and he rejoins his parents. He leaves the, the dead lion there in the vineyard. And we'll come back to the lion in a little bit. But they continue on to Timnah, and they meet the girl, and he wants the marriage. And so uh, the father of the groom and the father of a bride would negotiate. They would come together, and they would organize the wedding. And then uh, Samson and his parents go back to their village. Uh, sometime later, when, they return, when they're returning to Timnah for the wedding itself, uh, Samson again detours because he wants to see the lion's carcass. And he gets there and it's been enough time that lion's carcass is there open and remember he's torn it up to pieces. And in the carcass, a swarm of bees has made a beehive. So he knows right away. And he goes into the carcass and he reaches in and he pulls out a big scoop of honey. Oh sweets and he eats the honey then he sticks it back in there again and he brings out another handful and now he goes back and he catches up with his mom and dad who have continued walking and he gives them honey to eat now this is a picture of samson in his impulsiveness and his self-centeredness 
because he does not consider for a moment that, number one, as a Nazarite, they were forbidden to be around anybody that was dead, anything, any dead thing. That was, they were not allowed to be that. And then he gives the honey to his mom and his dad. And for any Jewish person, any Hebrew, if you ate something that was unclean, and this was unclean because it was within the body of a dead animal, you could only atone for that sin through a burnt offering. But they didn't know, and he didn't tell them, but they're still held accountable. So he allows them to be stuck in that sin because he just didn't care about it. And so they continue on their way to Timnah, and he, uh, they get there for the celebration, and he's given 30 companions for the celebration. It would be kind of like part of the wedding party. And these are all Philistines, uh, friends and family of the bride, and they are given to Sam Samson as kind of his companions during the festivities. At that time, the culture, the wedding was really just a small part, the ceremony. They exchanged vows, uh, the uh, parents exchanged uh, contracts, and uh, then the party began. And it went for seven days, this wedding celebration. And so part of that celebration included a lot of wine. Remember Jesus turning uh, water into wine at the, at the wedding in Cana. So there's a lot of wine flowing, and that's a challenge for a Nazarite, right? He's not supposed to have any fermented drink, but he does anyway. He's participating in that. But another thing that's happening as part of that is uh, the use of riddles. Apparently, the use of riddles was commonplace amongst those wedding feasts as part of the festivities. And so God supplied Samson with the source of the riddle. Let me, let me read this to you. First, he goes in, in uh, verse 12. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Well, the companions go, ah, we'll take it because there's 30 of us to think about it. This looks like good odds. Tell us the riddle. Let's hear it. And he replies this. Out of the eater something to eat out of the strong something sweet what is he referencing the lion right and now nobody else knows about the lion not even the parents but samson remembers it and that's the course of his riddle now the companions take the riddle and for the first three days of the feast they are stumped they can't figure it out and so now they're starting to get a little nervous. And on the fourth day, they go to the, to the wife, the wife now of Samson. And they say, you better talk to your husband and get the answer for that riddle. Because if you don't, we're going to take you and your father and all his household and we're going to burn you to death. Now these were relatives and family and friends. And I'm thinking... Oh, I don't want to be part of that family. But they issued this challenge to him, and now the bride is crying and in tears. And she cries the, all the rest of the days of the feast, every day crying and crying and complaining. And she says, she threw herself at him sobbing. She goes, you hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't even told me the answer. Because I hadn't even given the answer to my mom and dad. Why would I give it to you? Nice wedding. She cried the whole seven days of the feast. And so on the seventh day, he's had it. He finally tells her. And he explains everything because she had continued to press him. And what happens? She runs and tells the companions the answer to the riddle. And so before sunset on the seventh day, that the feast was over on the sense, on the, at sunset on the seventh day, and right before sunset, the companions come up to him. They go, uh, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And immediately, Samson's countenance changes. 
He thought he was going to get himself 30 sets of clothes. And immediately they give the answer. He goes, you got the answer from my wife. He says it this way. You would not have been able to answer if you had not plowed with my heifer. Again, another insight into Samson's character. But he's mad. And now he takes this anger. And he storms off. Now, there have been times when I've been angry with my wife. We had an argument. And I leave. I'll walk out. And I might just want to walk. I'll walk two blocks. And I'll go, all right, I'm done. And I go back home and we work it out. Right? Samson walks six hours. Six hours to another Philistine town, Ashkelon, which was one of the main cities of the Philistines. He walks six hours to Ashkelon. He kills 30 men, takes their belongings, walks six hours back, and gives them to pay off his debt. Talk about determination. He is determined and he is motivated by anger, and that anger is propelling him. My anger lasts about two blocks. Samson's anger lasted for 12 hours. You only killed one man. And I only killed one. <laughs> so it's so interesting to see that thing. But here's the thing. God knows this about Samson. And he is using Samson's anger to accomplish his purpose. The Holy Spirit came across uh, Samson and he kills 30 men through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that, Cindy and I had a long time, a long discussion about that. But yet, it's not, it's what it is, it's, it's talking about the power of the Spirit and what God's plan was. Remember God's plan from the very first time the angel spoke to the wife of Manoah. He will begin the deliverance of Israel from the Philistine oppression. And that's what he's doing. And it's just amazing to me that that kind of stuff happens. We're out of time for today. We're going to continue it next week. But let me give you this thought, that just like Samson, there is a plan for each one of us. I'm not talking about the church as a whole, all of us here today, or even the church, the universal church. I mean, those are all true. But for each one of us individually today, God has a plan for your life. And he's ordering our steps to accomplish that plan. So if that's the case, wouldn't it be easier for us to forget about what we want, those things that take us away from God, and instead reach out beyond ourselves for what God wants in our life? Wouldn't that make our lives a little bit easier? Yeah. It would. So what we're going to do is we're going to close in prayer. The band is going to come up. And then we're going to take communion after the band is up here. But for the moment here, join me in prayer. Father, as we've come today, Lord, I'm just praying that the words of your book, your Bible, penetrate each of us, Lord, in a new and fresh way. That we can take the lessons that we learned here and apply them to ourselves in a sense that be, we would be willing to open our lives up to the work that you want to do. And that may be some grandiose idea. Or it may be something as simple as loving the neighbor next door. It may be something as simple as helping a friend. But those things, Lord, are all according to your plan. And we want to be part of that plan. I pray that you would continue to indwell us with your spirit and continue to move us in that way. Pastor Jason's going to come up and administer the, the communion. And so uh, they're going to pass out the communion implements.
while communion is being handed out, we're going to, uh, the band's going to sing a song, Please Worship With Us. And then I will lead us in the implements. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Love the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, love is holy implements so as Christians we're we're reminded um, the night before Jesus was betrayed and went to the cross for us he had dinner with his friends with his disciples and when they were eating he shared with them what was going to happen and he asked them to eat with him to take the bread to drink of the wine and he told them what it was going to be a symbol of and he asked them do this in my name every time you gather together as a remembrance of me. And so as we, as our, we have the implements ready, I'm going to read from the book of Mark. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he, he gave it to his disciples saying, take this. This is my body. Let's take with the body. And after he had taken the bread, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to them and they all drank. He said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Let's drink of the blood. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the beautiful things you do, Father. The very, sometimes crazy, outlandish things you do, Father, like we see in the life of Samson, as Pastor Ernie has been teaching us about, Lord. And we see it in, in this instance with your son, Lord. We never, we never would have thought of such a wonderful thing, such an amazing thing, Father, that you would come down, your son would take on flesh, that he would live a perfect life. He would heal us, he would teach us, he would love us, and then he would give up himself. 
We thank you, Father, for the blood. We thank you for the body. Lord, bless us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can stand with us and we'll close out again with this song. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. said. Amen. 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 Go in peace. In the back room, we have goodies and cookies and fellowship, so enjoy each other.